Good evening and welcome. I'm Brian Ogilvie, Professor of History and Chair of the History Department uh, at UMass Amherst. I'd like to begin this event by acknowledging that our university community stands on Nanatok land, and I'd also like to acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohican and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. It is my pleasure to welcome you to A World in a Shell, a lecture by the field philosopher and storyteller, Professor Tom Van Doren. Tonight's event is presented by the Feinberg Family Distinguished Lecture Series. Offered every other year by the Department of History at UMass Amherst, each iteration of the series focuses on a big issue, a topic of clear and compelling concern. The events invite us to consider historical context, analysis, and experience to better understand this pressing issue. This year's series is titled Planet on a Precipice, Histories and Futures of the Environmental Emergency. It seeks to deepen our understanding of the environmental emergency through historical analysis, and in so doing, to envision constructive paths forward. For more information about the series and to register for future events, including our next event on November 12th, an expert panel on the election results and the history and future of environmental policy, please take a look at the chat box. Here, you'll also find information about how to turn on live to closed captioning and how to listen to tonight, tonight's event in Spanish. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the more than three dozen university and community partners who collaborated with us to make this series possible. I warmly invite everyone to join us after the event for 25 minute discussion groups hosted by PhD students in environmental humanities. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Malcolm Sen, assistant professor at UMass Amherst, a member of the Feinberg Series Advisory Committee and director of the Environmental Humanities Specialization in the Department of English. Professor Sen's award-winning research focuses on questions of sovereignty, migration, and race as they emerge in climate change discourse. He is the author of numerous articles, multiple edited volumes, including post-colonial studies and challenges of the new millennium, the history of Irish literature and the environment, and next year, uh, of race in Irish literature and culture, and the author of Unnatural Disasters, Irish Literature, Climate Change, and Sovereignty, currently under review. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Malcolm Sen. Thank you all for joining us today for the third lecture in this year's Feinberg Lecture Series. I'm Malcolm Sen, an assistant professor in the Department of English at UMass Amherst, and you're all very welcome to this half an hour, or hour and a half event. It is my great pleasure and honor really to introduce you to our speaker today, Tom Van Duren. He's an associate professor and Australian Research Council Future Fellow in the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies and the Sydney Environment Institute at the University of Sydney in Australia. He's also a professor at the Oslo School of Environmental Humanities at the University of Oslo in Norway. You know, these multiple affiliations are really only brief indicators of his eminence. If you are familiar with the increasingly relevant and often alarmingly urgent scholarship being pursued under the umbrella term of the environmental humanities, then you will know, of course, that Tom Van Duren co-founded one of the first academic journals that was fully dedicated to this area of inquiry. His books, Flightways, Life and Loss at the Edge of Extinction, which was published in 2014, and The Wake of Crows, Living and Dying in Shared Worlds, which was published only last year, I think offer us crucial vantage points to conceptualize, narrate, and act at this historical juncture of otherwise unimaginable endings. We can call this you know, contemporary moment many things, of course, a time that is radically shaped by irreversible climate change, a time therefore of rapid environmental breakdown, and globally dispersed sociopolitical crises. Or we can choose to recognize the geological forces being exerted by certain human societies and name this moment the Anthropocene, a time of calamity and chaos of such magnitude that it overshadows all other transformative changes experienced by humans. To think with Van Duren, I think, is to realize all this, but afresh, from what he and his late collaborator Deborah Bird Rose has called the edges of extinction, 
Van Duren's scholarship attempts, as he himself has described it, to weave tales that add flesh to the bones of the dead and the dying, that give them some vitality, presence, perhaps thickness on the page and in the minds and lives of readers. Indeed, this contemporary moment is also increasingly being recognized as that of the sixth extinction. And this extinction crisis is very real, although it is often made invisible, especially through discourses of neoliberal utopias that disguise themselves as effective responses to the climate crisis. The extinction of multiple species on this planet hundreds if not thousands of times above what scientists call the background rate of extinction is not a macabre subject and mournful reflection on the passing of an entire species is not the only response that witnessing such endings should generate. To pay attention to extinction is to be alert to, as Van Duren reminds us, of life forms and forms of life as those forms are manifested in both human and more than human dimensions. I'm eagerly looking forward to this lecture and do not want to take up too much of your time, but I would be remiss if I did not give you a sense of the historicized deliberation that underlies the enigmatic scope of Van Duren's work. So what might the long-billed vulture, Hinduism and poverty have in common? In a striking chapter on the decimated vulture population in India in his book, Flightways, Van Duren makes visible an ecological web within which the precarious nature of avian life is entangled with the precarity faced by marginalized human societies. While reflecting on this topic, it seemed to me that it is as if the vulture whose scavenging work on cattle carcasses is crucial to keep endemic diseases such as anthrax in check is almost as important to Hinduism as the deified and now thoroughly politicized cow. From this edge of extinction, we see that the demise of the vulture population in India is closely related to the chemical pain management of overworked cattle. That in turn is related to an increase in the population of rabies carrying feral dogs. Van Duren reminds us that 87% of people killed by rabies in India are from low income backgrounds. In effect, what he demonstrates is that avian entanglements, once made visible, allow us to better understand the unique precarities of everyday life faced by those who have been equally erased out of historical record. This is the kind of field philosophy that breaks down artificial silos between history, zoology, the social sciences, and the study of narratives. At this historical juncture of a global pandemic, when a sub-microscopic and pathogenic agent plays havoc with individual bodies and the body politic, it is especially clear why such scholarship is crucial in efforts to build habitable futures. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Tom Van Duren, whose talk today is entitled, A World in a Shell, The Disappearing Snails of Hawaii. Thanks very much, Malcolm. Thanks for that very generous welcome. Um, just, great. Um, so I think I'm sharing my screen um, and I'll begin. Um, I also wanted to start just by saying thank you to um, the organizers of this really captivating and important series, um, to Heidi, Jess, Erica, Liz, uh, and all of the other people who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes uh, to do all of the things that go on to make uh, these kinds of events possible. So thank you all very much. Um, and thank you all for joining us uh, tonight, as it is uh, in the US or this morning in Australia, um, for making the time to come along uh, and hear a bit about some snails. Um, snails are incredible creatures that all too often don't get the kind of care and attention uh, that they so richly deserve. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to also um, begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Gunungurra and the Darug people and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to this country that they've cared for for innumerable generations. 
The stories I'd like to share with you uh, tonight are from another colonised land, Hawaii. And so I'd also like to acknowledge the Kanaka Maoli, the native Hawaiian people, and their ongoing struggles to malama aina, to care for the land and its community. And with that, I will begin. So the dirt track we were walking on wove its way along a rocky ridgeline of the Waianae Mountains on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. Each side of the narrow path was lined by an assortment of windswept plants, foremost amongst them the hardy red blossom dohia. If we'd walked this way 100 years ago, perhaps even 50, these branches would also have been laden with another colourful presence, that of the kahuli, the tree snails. Upland forests like this one were once thick with their brightly coloured forms. Hundreds of snails might have been found living within a single tree. Unlike the leaf-eating garden snails more familiar to most of us, these snails would not have harmed their botanical hosts. Rather, their diet consisted exclusively of the thin layer of fungi and other microbes that line the surface of the leaves. As they made their nocturnal movements through the branches, they cleaned as they went. Around the trunks of these plants in the decomposing leaf matter, other less conspicuous snails would once also have roamed. Consumers of dead leaf matter, detritivores, these snails would have contributed to the health of Hawaii's forests by breaking down organic materials and releasing nutrients back into the soil. But as we walked through this place, we encountered none of these snails, not in the branches or among the decaying leaves. We walked through a landscape now missing most of the diverse species that once called this place home. But we walked towards snails nonetheless. My guides were two biologists, Dave Sisko and Kupa'a He. More accurately, I was tagging along on one of their routine trips to one of the few places where these snails can still be found reliably in this mountain range. Indeed, one of the few places where they're now to be found in abundance anywhere in the Hawaiian Islands. After about an hour of walking up and down through the undulating and often muddy terrain, we arrived at our destination. The forest opened into a small clearing and in front of us stood a shoulder height green metal fence, the Palikea Exclosure. Encircling roughly 1600 square meters of vegetated land, the Exclosure is a place of refuge for rare snails who have been rescued from surrounding forests. It's called an exclosure rather than an enclosure because its function is not primarily to keep these snails in, but rather to keep others out, specifically to exclude the many predators of snails that have arrived in these islands with their human inhabitants. Predators like rats, Jackson's chameleons, and most importantly of all, the rosy wolf snail, a species of carnivorous snail that tracks and consumes the local species with incredible and insidious efficiency. Keeping all of these predators out is no small feat, a complex series of barriers line the exclosure walls from a curved lip that stops rats getting up and over through to a set of solar powered wires that deliver an electric shock to any predatory snails that might be trying to make their way up the walls. These exclosures are a key component of the work of the Hawaii State Government's Snail Extinction Prevention Program, or SEP for short, which is headed up by David Sisko. In partnership with US Fish and Wildlife, the Department of Defense, and several other organizations, SEP runs eight exclosures across the island of Oahu, with four more in planning and development. In addition to these fenced areas, though, SEP also maintains a captive population of a range of endangered snail species in its laboratory, a large trailer that functions as an ark of sorts for its slimy inhabitants. Inside its walls, snails live out their lives inside plastic containers housed within carefully monitored environmental chambers, hopefully producing offspring that can one day be released back into the wider world. The sad reality, however, is that even with these various facilities, SEP is only able to protect a fraction of Hawaii's threatened snails. And with each passing year, more and more species find themselves in need. To put the matter simply, the snail situation in Hawaii is dire. In our conversations, David and his colleagues described a rapidly unfolding crisis on an immense scale. These islands were once home to one of the most diverse assemblages of snails found anywhere on earth. 752 species of Hawaiian land snails have been officially described by taxonomists. To put this in some sort of context, Hawaii had two thirds of the number of snail species that are found in the whole of North America 
a landmass roughly 1,700 times the size. Sadly, however, almost two thirds of Hawaii snail species are thought to already be extinct, most in the past 100 years or so. Equally as concerning, the vast majority of those species that do remain are heading quickly in the same direction. Getting a precise handle on the snail situation in Hawaii is a truly difficult task. The simple fact is that we just don't know how bad things are, at least not in a way that can be readily quantified. We don't know exactly how many snail species there are or were in the islands, let alone the current conservation status of all of those species. The situation is strikingly different to dealing with endangered birds or mammals, where species tend to be thought about and managed individually or in small groups. In the world of Hawaii snails, endangered species conservation must take place in bulk. It must deal with hundreds of species of tiny animals identifiable only to specialists and possessing only a Latin name, and most of them relatively little studied. As a result, scientists generally lack the data to formally list even some of the most threatened snails under the US Endangered Species Act. In short, this is a space simultaneously of profound uncertainty and urgency, a deeply difficult space to occupy if you care about the future of snails. Ultimately, however, current conservation efforts are at best a stopgap measure. As David explained to me, restoration of these species is just not possible at the moment. Extinction prevention is the best that we can hope for. And even that isn't always possible. All over the island of Oahu and beyond when resources allow, David and his team are engaged in what he thinks about as an evacuation, trying desperately to locate the last remnants of snail species. Just a few years ago, they would try to take only a small number of snails from these populations as a backup, leaving the rest in the forest. In the intervening years, however, they've seen about 15 formerly robust populations, each comprised of hundreds of snails, completely disappear. Some were the last known free living populations of their species, like that of the beautiful tree snail, Acatonella lila. As a result, despite initial reluctance, the SEP team are now often pulling out every snail they can find carefully packing them into containers and bringing them into the lab or an exclosure. At a time that's increasingly being thought about as the sixth mass extinction event in Earth's history, we need multiple stories, diverse efforts to experiment and explore, to thicken and enliven the many forms of life that are slipping away. This lecture offers a series of snail stories woven together around questions of knowing and relating, of wonder and mystery. At its core, however, this lecture is a response to a single question that I found myself more and more preoccupied by. How did a global center of terrestrial snail diversity end up out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? Snails, after all, are not commonly known for their propensity to undertake long journeys, not by land and certainly not by sea, where their low tolerance for salt water must surely cause significant problems. So how did they all get here? And equally as importantly at our present time, how might the ongoing extinctions of snails be understood differently if we pay attention to these deep time processes? What might this context help us to see, appreciate, and perhaps even hold on to? As I stood in the Palikea exclosure on the day of my visit, it was these questions of extinction and loss that preoccupied me. But I had another interest too, standing amongst one particularly nice cluster of about 15 critically endangered Acatonella mustelina, their vibrant white shells in the leaves all around me, I took the opportunity to listen. Listening isn't something that one ordinarily does with snails, but in this case, I did so because it's said that the kahuli sings in the forest. In fact, another Hawaiian name for these snails is pupu kanioi, literally translating as shell sounding long. This singing is one of the strongest and most consistent themes associated with snails, in Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiian Mo'olelo and Oli, stories and chants. It isn't clear what form this singing might take. It's described by some as beautiful. Others have told me it's a single high-pitched note. In the texts where it's mentioned, the singing of Kahuli is deeply meaningful, often associated, uh, often occurring as a sign, sorry, that after a series of adventures, changes or turbulences, all is pono again, all is righteous, correct and good. But while I listened for singing that day, I heard no song. Perhaps as many biologists I asked, asked about the phenomenon told me, this is because snails cannot sing. 
Perhaps it was because it was daytime and snails only sing at night when they're most active. Or perhaps they didn't sing that day and don't sing much, if ever, anymore, because everything is a long, long way from being right in the world. Each new drawer we opened revealed another set of wonders, another surprise in colour or variation in shape or size. In one drawer, we encountered the cone shells of Corellia terricula, a now extinct ground dwelling snail that's thought to have once been the largest in the Hawaiian Islands. In another drawer, the tiny, delicate, translucent forms of Succinia lumbalis. In many others, we found the glossy, colourful forms of Acatonella snails, some with bands and stripes, others patterned in ways reminiscent of tweed or tortoise shell. Drawer after drawer, cabinet after cabinet, row after row, we moved through the Malacology collection of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, ultimately only seeing a tiny selection of their shells. My guide was Nora Jung, researcher and manager of this incredible collection of roughly 6 million Pacific Island snail shells, the largest of its kind in the world. While a lot of this collecting was done by museum staff, a significant number of these shells have been donated to the museum by private collectors or their families. In fact, it seems that almost as soon as Europeans and Americans started arriving in these islands, they began collecting up snail shells, in some cases on a staggering scale. From the scientific collectors of early European expeditions through to the hobbyists and picnic fam picnicking families who made a game of collecting in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, engaging in what some locals of the period referred to as land shell fever. In this way, shell collecting became part of the larger domesticating processes that settled these people in this new land during a period in which the Hawaiian monarchy and government was overthrown and islands, the islands became a settler colonial dominion of the United States. Numerous reports exist from this period of people traveling into the mountains for a few hours of snail scented fun, returning with saddlebags overflowing with thousands of shells. Today, there are likely fewer individual snails of a whole range of species left in the island's forests than were collected by some of these groups over a period of a few hours. There's no doubt that these collecting practices had a significant impact on Hawaii snails, perhaps even causing the extinction of some species. As has so often happened, in at least some cases, it seems that collection was explicitly motivated by a desire to catalogue this diversity before it was lost. But snail shell collecting has had its day in Hawaii. It is now a negligible consideration in the decline of these species. Rather, as I saw firsthand at the Palikea exclosure, it is a host of introduced predators who are thought to be now be the key drivers of snail extinctions. In addition, however, Hawaii snails are struggling with the long legacies and steadily escalating realities of a transforming environment. To a certain extent, this decline began with the arrival of Polynesian peoples about 1500 years ago, as they cleared lowland forests to make room for kalo, or taro, and the other agricultural plants that would allow these islands to sustain human life. At the same time, the rats that they brought with them, voracious consumers of seed and fruit, are thought to have begun a process of significantly altering the composition of the island's forests. But these processes of forest loss were drastically ramped up from the early 19th century with the arrival of Europeans and Americans as vast areas of land were taken over for plantations and ranching and then for tourism, urban and military developments. These are complex and charged stories of environmental decline bound up with the ongoing process through which Kanaka Maoli were themselves dispossessed of their ancestral lands. As Nori and I moved through the Bishop Museum collection that day, she told me about the diverse threats faced by Hawaii snails. She also explained some of what is known about the species we encountered, their environments, their conservation statuses, their life histories. With each draw, it became apparent both what a remarkable collection this is, and at the same time, how utterly it fails to capture and contain the incredible diversity of the island's snails. Even something as seemingly straightforward as color cannot really be retained in the collection in any full way. The color in a snail's shell, it turns out, resides only in the outer layer, the periostracum, which decays after death to eventually leave behind only a white calcium carbonate core. Depending on conditions, 
This can take a few years or be delayed for centuries in a climate controlled collection in a museum. Even the uncolored translucent shells do not readily reveal the living forms of their once occupants. For example, as they moved through the misty rainforests of the island of Kauai, Succinia lumbalis, which has a, a transparent shell, would have been human, to, would have been red to the human observer. In this case, because their translucent shell revealed the colorful flesh and some of the internal organs that lay below. In other words, a shell collection is not a substitute for living snails in the world. While it's a vitally important resource for the crafting of all sorts of knowledge, not least the kind of information that might aid in snail conservation, there's so much that it cannot tell us about how these snails once lived and matted in their environments. Even more importantly, this collection cannot hold on to and sustain those diverse living relationships themselves. It cannot enable the ongoing interactions between snails, people, trees and soils that have in their own ways, small or large, shaped life for everyone in these islands. So the first snails I encountered in the Hawaiian forest though were of a far less showy variety than those of the genus Acatonella. In fact, so much so that they were actually pretty hard to see. A few weeks before my visit to the Palikea Exclosure, I was hiking with Brendan Holland, a snail biologist with a passion for biogeography in a mountainous area on the outskirts of Honolulu. We'd come to see a few of the smaller endemic tree snail species that persist in this forest just outside the city. As we walked, Brendan pointed out snails of a few different species, each of them not more than a millimeter or two in size. I quizzed him about snail biogeography as we went. In particular, I wanted to know how the diverse snails of Hawaii made their way to these remote oceanic islands. The short answer I discovered is that we don't really know for certain. Terrestrial snails are generally a pretty sedentary bunch, spending their lives close to the spot they happen to be born or hatched on. When we add to this situation their very low tolerance for seawater, as they have no control over their salt absorption and thus dehydrate readily, the diverse range of snail species found in this remote archipelago becomes even more confounding. The Hawaiian island chain formed over a volcanic hotspot out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. This means that all of the diverse species of plants and animals that have made their homes in this place arrived over vast expanses of water or evolved from an ancestor who did. This situation has left a lasting impact on the island's animal biota. In simple terms, they tend to have wings. In fact, when it comes to vertebrate animals, Hawaii was for the longest time a land of birds. Until people introduced them, there were no terrestrial mammals or reptiles, with the sole exception of a winged mammal, the hoary bat. Looking around the Hawaiian forest, the legacies of this history of arrival seem to be everywhere on display. That is until the intricate form of a large brightly colored tree snail comes into view. This situation is in no way unique to Hawaii though. Terrestrial snails are found on pretty much every tropical and subtropical island around the world. We're faced then with a kind of snail paradox, as Brendan put it. How do organisms that are so sedentary end up being so incredibly widely dispersed? Biologists have long puzzled over this question. Charles Darwin, in a letter to Alfred Russell Wallace in 1857, summed the situation up succinctly. One of the subjects on which I've been experimentizing and which cost me much trouble is the means of distribution of all organic beings found on oceanic islands. And any facts on this subject will be most gratefully received. Land mollusks are a great perplexity to me. Today, it's thought that snails likely use or get caught up in a variety of modes of long distance movement. Not all of those methods are immediately obvious though, if we only look at these snails in their current forms. This was one of the reasons that Brendan had suggested we make this trip. Some of the tiny snails we encountered on our walk, members of the subfamily Tornitolinidae, are relatives of the much larger tree snails of the genus Acatonella. While the former reach a maximum length of about one or two millimeters, no bigger than a grain of rice, the latter are about two centimeters long. 
If the ancestors of the larger Acatonella snails were tiny creatures like their relatives, only becoming gigantic, relatively speaking, of course, after generations of life on Oahu, then they might have had other modes of transportation open to them. Most importantly, Brendan thinks the tiny ancestral forms might have traveled here by bird. The basic idea is that these snails climbed on board as a migratory bird perched or nested overnight. Snails, after all, are nocturnal. These snails then hunkered down deep in the bird's feathers, only climbing off once they'd safely arrived at their destination. This is a proposal that I must admit I was quite dubious about. That is, until I saw the tiny forms of the Tornitolinidae snails. While it still seems horribly unlikely that this sequence of events would ever take place, in the fullness of evolutionary time, perhaps those are actually pretty reasonable odds. Other scientists I spoke to agreed. The universal, even if tentative view that I encountered among the community of snail biologists in Hawaii is that this kind of avian dispersal, especially of smaller ancestral species, is the most likely avenue for their arrival. There are, however, several other possibilities for snail movement across oceans, especially for the shorter trips between islands in the chain that genetics research indicates have taken place at various points in the history of some of these species. Some of these snails may have traveled inside birds. Recent studies have shown that a variety of species of snails around the world can survive passage through avian digestive tracts at a relatively high frequency. Other snails might have flown on leaves or other debris high in the airstream, yet others likely rafted over on logs or bark. While snails don't do well in salt water, it seems that they do have a few tricks for survival. Most land snails can form an epiphram, which is essentially a temporary cover of mucus used to seal their aperture to prevent them from drying out. Studies going back at least as far as Darwin have shown that dormant snails submerged in salt water can sometimes survive for weeks at a time. There haven't been any significant experiments of this kind on Hawaii snails, with the exception of a small trial conducted by Brendan that showed that individuals of one non-endangered species, Succinia caduca, might survive in salt water long enough to make short inter-island trips floating on a branch or another raft. These are undoubtedly all rather unreliable ways to travel. For every snail that successfully arrived in a strange new land on a bird or a floating log, countless millions must have been washed, blown or flown out to sea without such luck. The odds must be slightly better traveling by bird than by log. At least in theory, if you hop onto or into a migratory bird in a forest, you're quite likely to be taken to another forest. Of course, for those snails unfortunate enough to be traveling inside the bird, they'd have to survive the journey through the digestive system too. Snails are largely at the whim of external forces in these movements, subject to what biologists call passive dispersal. As Brendan helpfully summed it up for me, biogeographically, snails are plants. Both groups sharing many of the same vectors for movement, the latter plants usually by seed or spore. This is clearly a system of island dispersal that can only hope to achieve results with immense periods of time at its disposal. Over millions of years, a few lucky snails made these journeys successfully. We really can't know for certain how many times this happened in the Hawaiian Islands. At an absolute minimum though, in order to have ended up with this, the diverse range of known terrestrial species, things must have worked out for at least 15 intrepid travelers over roughly the past 5 million years. This means that the vast majority of Hawaii snail species evolved in the islands from a relatively small number of common ancestors. While snails undoubtedly have many things working against them in these travels, the simple fact that they're found on islands almost everywhere tells us that despite appearances, they're actually very good at dispersing and establishing themselves in new places. While they might not fly or enjoy salt water, they're small and robust enough to take advantage of other modes of movement. But these snails have another dispersal advantage over many other animals that only really becomes apparent after arrival, a reproductive advantage. Hawaii's land snails, like others around the world, are all hermaphrodites. This means that for successful establishment to take place, any two individuals will do. In fact, in some cases, one might be enough. Some snails are capable of selfing or self-fertilization. 
and others can store sperm from copulation for long periods of time and use it at a later date. There's clearly something very passive about the dispersal of snails around the world, always at the whim of others, be they birds, storms or tides, traveling under their steam and direction. But this also isn't the whole of the story. Deep multi-generational evolutionary histories have produced the kinds of living beings that can move around the world in these ways. These modes of passive movement only work because snails have evolved some pretty remarkable traits that enable dispersal, survival and reproduction across and into isolated new lands. From epiphrams that seal them up tight to hermaphroditism and self-fertilization. Millions of years and countless generations of more or less successful journeys have selected for those individuals that survived and established themselves best. There's a profound kind of evolutionary agency at work here, a creative, experimental, adaptive working out of living forms with particular capacities and propensities. For the most part, individual snails are indeed relatively passive in all this. They're not, however, irrelevant. Snails are not stones, the particular actions of those little beings that crawled onto a bird, that opted to seal up their apertures, that safely stored away sperm for future use, mattered profoundly. But nor are snails involved in the more active, sometimes even deliberate dispersal undertaken by some other animals. Instead, if we pay attention, snails are amazed with their capacity to move so far, to spread so widely while doing so little. This, it seems to me, is one of the real marvels of snail biogeography. Individuals do not need to exert great effort because natural selection has acted for them or acted on them, acted with them to produce these beings that are so unexpectedly but uniquely suited to a particular form of deep time travel, drifting. From such a perspective, rather than being a kind of deficiency, the highly successful passivity of snails might be seen as a remarkable evolutionary achievement. There's so much more to learn here, so much to learn about the processes that have given rise to snail forms of life that are so oddly suited to islands. So much to learn about not just the vectors, but the patterns under which dispersal takes place. Are they perhaps laid down by atmospheric and oceanic currents or by the paths of avian migration? And yet, to some extent, this must remain a space of uncertainty and even mystery. How can one really study processes of biogeography that take place across such vast periods of time and space? As Brendan reminded me, it's likely that in the history of these islands, on average, one species of snail has arrived and successfully established itself roughly every 300,000 years. Put simply, it's not something that any of us are likely to ever see, let alone study firsthand. In all, 752 species of Hawaiian land snails have been officially described to date. This is an incredible diversity of snails for these tiny land masses to have once supported. It's likely that only a little over a third of these species remain in the islands today in various states of precariousness. This is perhaps a particular tragedy because the vast majority of these species are found nowhere else. In fact, almost all of Hawaii's larger snail species were what biologists call single island endemics found only on one island. And in many cases, only a single mountain range or within that range, a single volcano or valley. The cause of this very high level of endemism, of course, is the fact that most species evolved in the islands, single arrival events giving rise to one new species and then another and then another as populations separated and diverged. But why did so many different species evolve in these tiny areas of land? In no small way, it was the Hawaiian islands themselves that produced the conditions for this incredible diversity. They did so through the relatively ideal environment that they provide, plenty of moist, entirely or largely predator-free forests. As on islands elsewhere, snails in Hawaii were able to adapt to take up roles or ecological niches that are often filled by other species on continental land masses. For example, in the absence of earthworms and other detritivores who specialize in breaking down leaf matter and organic materials, snails took up this work in Hawaii. Many other snails in Hawaii subsist entirely on the thin layer of fungi and microbes that they scrape off the surface of plants using their specialized radula, which is a kind of tongue lined with tiny teeth 
that's found on the underside of a snail's foot. In fact, there are no known snail species in Hawaii that eat living plant matter. Instead, they decompose and they're cleaned. We have no way of really knowing just how important these functions were in Hawaii's forests prior to the decimation of both snails and forests. Some preliminary work has suggested that leaf cleaning might have helped to ensure a diverse microbial community that may in turn limit the spread of pathogenic surface microbes on plants. Perhaps regular cleaning also enhanced plants' capacities for photosynthesis. From such a perspective, it's too simple to say that snails adapted to the forest, and we must instead acknowledge the possibility of a much more profound co-shaping in which snails also help to produce and maintain these forest ecosystems that they then in turn adapted to. Again, there remains much to be learned here and much that will probably never fully be understood. But perhaps more important than any kind of adaptive relationship, the Hawaiian Islands also offered remarkable opportunities for the kind of separation and isolation that allows snail populations to simply drift apart into different species. The main Hawaiian islands, the high islands, are lands of incredible ecological diversity and patchiness, with rainfall and vegetation often varying dramatically across relatively short distances. Many of these landscape features form impassable barriers for snails, at least most of the time. Unlike birds and other highly mobile animals that can spread out across an island into all areas of similar suitable habitat, snails rely on occasional dispersal across barriers by intermittent forces, such as hurricanes, floods and slope failures, or perhaps birds. This means that snail populations once separated are less likely to reconnect, at least any time soon. In one study, it was found that two populations of the same species of tree snail, separated by only a few kilometers, had experienced no gene flow between them for a couple of million years. This kind of isolation creates ideal conditions for populations to simply drift off in different evolutionary directions, giving rise to one or more new species in each locale. In other cases, movements of the land itself might open up new barriers. This could happen through a landslide that carries some snails out to sea or an over to another island, or it may happen over immense periods of time as a deep valley is eroded out of a volcanic mountain chain, creating a warmer and drier barrier zone that's less hospitable for snails between the two peaks. There are numerous paths to this kind of separation of one or a few snails from a larger population. The landscape of the Hawaiian Islands offered an ideal environment for this kind of speciation. But snails played their part in this process too. Snails are themselves ideally suited to this kind of drifting speciation as a result of their largely sedentary form, their largely sedentary form of life that's punctuated by occasional moments of long distance dispersal. The curator removed a small box about the size of a dinner plate from the cabinet, walked over to the bench and placed it down. Inside two delicately interwoven strands of kahuli shells, all of the genus Acatonella combined to form a stunning lay. I was in another part of the Bishop Museum, the Ethological Collection, this time to see the one and only lay that they hold that's comprised entirely of terrestrial Hawaiian snail shells. This lay is also distinguished by its former owner, Queen Liliokalani, the last monarch of the sovereign nation of Hawaii. Liliokalani was overthrown in 1893 by a group of mostly American citizens and Hawaiian subjects of American descent with the assistance of US Marines from the USS Boston, which was docked in Honolulu at the time. Little is known for certain about Liliokalani's lay, why, how, why, or when she acquired it, in fact, while lei made from marine shells are very common in Hawaii, the shells of forest snails seem to have been far less frequently used in this way. This lei reminds us that the lives of the Hawaiian people, the Kanaka Maoli, have long been tangled up with snails. Their shells were used to adorn the bodies of hula dancers and their kuahu, or their altars. According to occasional references in the literature, some large snails may have been eaten by people, both raw and cooked inside the leaves of the tea plant. But perhaps more important than any of these kinds of uses, snails were potent symbols and omens in people's lives and stories, often indicating positive and righteous action and circumstances. 
This is, as I've already mentioned, something that the stories tell us snails did most powerfully through their singing. People that I've spoken to in Hawaii have had a range of ideas about this snail singing. <clears throat> Referencing a lack of vocal cords, many people have told me that snails do not sing and have offered one of two explanations for these stories. In the first case, it's said that this notion of singing is metaphorical, referring to the whistling sound that might be made as the wind rush, rushes over the opening of a snail shell as it hangs from a leaf or branch. In centuries past, when the forest was thick with snails, the sound might have combined to produce a melody of sorts. Others feel that this explanation is extremely unlikely. The biologist Mike Hadfield told me that these shells were just too small to make that kind of sound. What's more, snails tend to assiduously keep their apertures covered. As Mike put it, no self-respecting snail would give up its moisture by sitting there gaping into the wind. A second possible explanation for these stories of singing that I've heard from several people was expressed to me most eloquently by Sam Ohugon, a biologist and distinguished Kumu Oli, a singer and teacher of chants. Sam pointed out to me that Hawaiians were and are extremely observant people, but in this case, he thinks that perhaps the chirping of crickets might have been associated with the much more readily visible kahuli. He asked me to imagine visiting a dark forest at night with only the light of a sputtering torch to guide the way. You'd be surrounded by the sound of high-pitched singing because in Hawaii, there are hundreds of species of crickets. But he pointed out, as you approached the crickets, they would become quiet and even move away. You come over with your torch and you wanna to see what's making that sound. You turn over the leaves and the crickets have long since jumped away, but there are snails sitting there under the leaves, beautiful snails, no less. It'd be very easy to associate that singing whistling sound with those snails and you've disturbed them. So of course, if you put your ear to them, you're not gonna hear a, hear a thing. It's only when you put the leaf back and sit quietly for a minute that the singing begins again. And I should note that this is a second beautiful image from Sophie Fernandez that I've used. And I have to give a big thanks to Sophie who's allowed me to, to use these images that she did for an essay that I wrote for the Paris Museum of Nature and Hunting. So this, I'll turn then to the final strand of this story. Standing within the Palikea exclosure on the day of my visit, encircled by a fence fitted with layers of barriers, itself surrounded by a moat of cleared land, it was hard to fail to appreciate how profoundly fractured and isolated the lives and possibilities of Hawaii snails have become. This situation is perhaps exemplified in the story of one specific occupant of the exclosure, a master of Spirizona. This striking species with a bluish conical shell about 1.5 centimetres in length is now thought to be found nowhere else. The last 30 or so individuals were brought into the exclosure and placed within a large wire mesh and wooden box. The box keeps them together to ensure that a core breeding population can find each other to reproduce, while also allowing smaller juveniles to disperse through the mesh into the exclosure beyond. Happily, this is exactly what has been happening. The current population is at about 150 snails. While a Mastra spirizona is no doubt an extreme case, the sad reality is that most of Hawaii's remaining snail species can only survive in tiny, isolated, protected pockets of space. In short, they can only survive cut off from the environments, processes and relationships that birthed them. Environments that once provided the conditions not only for survival, but for an incredible radiation of diversity have become lethal. As I stood in the presence of these snails in the Palikea exclosure, I remembered a conversation earlier that week with Puakea Nogelmeyer, an expert in Hawaiian language and culture. When I asked Puakea about the traditional stories and ideas about snails singing, he replied with a story of his own. Many years earlier, Auntie Edith Kanaka Ole, the renowned composer and kumu hula, teacher of hula, told him and a group of her chant students that scientists had taken her to their lab to explain how impossible it was biologically for a snail to sing. He continued, Auntie Edith's take on that was, isn't that sad, they won't sing for the scientists. Auntie Edith's understanding, I think, draws us into another space of uncertainty, of mystery in the unfolding story of these snails. Uncertainty and mystery are not the same thing. While the former describes a lack of knowledge that might at some stage be acquired, 
Mystery, at least in the strong sense of the term, is an acknowledgement that the world is not, even in principle, fully knowable. Andy Edith reminds us that the world and the other living beings that comprise it are not objects transparent to our gaze, readily revealed. Each of us, scientist, kumuhula, philosopher, snail, knows one another, knows the world from the inside, which is to say that each of us only ever knows the world in a partial way. Much will always remain, must always remain, unknowable or simply knowable in other ways. The anthropologist Deborah Bird Rose tells us that this kind of mystery is a feature of all holistic systems. As, as Deborah Rose put it, one cannot remove oneself from the system under examination and because one is part of the system, the whole remains outside the possibility of one's comprehension. But Rose insists this mystery is a cause for celebration. It's something to be respected, cherished, guarded. Mystery signals the complexity and integrity of larger systems. A world that is entirely, no entirely knowable is a dead or dying one. Total predictability would signal crisis, loss of connection, loss of the larger system. From this perspective, mystery is inseparable from the vitality of the living world. This is by no means a celebration of ignorance, but rather a humble acknowledgement of the many layers and possibilities of our shared world. It might perhaps be seen as an acknowledgement of what is called kauna in Hawaiian, a term that's often used to refer to the many meanings, some of them hidden, carried within a story, but that as Noalani Arista notes, might also describe the more general tolerance and preference in Hawaiian thought for multiplicity in the relation between not only words, but also worlds. For as long as they or we endure, Hawaii snails will continue to draw us into worlds of uncertainty and mystery. These are spaces of not knowing that might reside in the one or many vectors by which these snails arrived in the islands or in relation to their possible ecological roles as cleaners and decomposers of leaves, or perhaps in relation to the way in which they might sing and make meaning in the world with and for the peoples of Hawaii. These diverse spaces of not knowing cannot really be lost in any absolute sense, but the possibility of our living well with them most certainly can. The possibility of inhabiting the world in a spirit of respectful curiosity, humility and wonder. As Hawaii's many incredible snail species slip away one by one, and as the worlds of those that manage to survive become increasingly fractured and simplified, we undermine our ability to find ways to relate to and value a world that is much bigger and more complex than we can know. We undermine the possibility of looking at a snail's shell and seeing a mystery that can never be uncoiled, but that must rather simply be lived with, questioned, explored, wondered about, chanted, danced and sung with, but ultimately always to remain at least partly unknown. Snails are just one way, or rather one constellation of ways, into a sense of a world that exceeds us. None of the snails I encountered in Hawaii sang in my presence, or if they did, I was not able to hear them. But thinking carefully with and about snails nonetheless drew me into new understandings, new modes of appreciation and respect. For me, at least, the immense biogeographical and evolutionary stories coiled in their tiny shells provide a potent portal into a world of incredible scope and complexity, of exciting understanding alongside ongoing and profound mystery. It's hard to really make sense of this vast assemblage of snail life. I imagine it as something like a giant network with strands stretching out across the Pacific Ocean and beyond, stretching back over evolutionary and geological timeframes. Each strand represents one of hundreds of unique species, millions of years of unlikely journeys nestled into a bird's feathers or perhaps tucked, stuck to a leaf or a branch, heading to destinations unknown millions of years of intergenerational agency that produced these intrepid, even if somewhat unlikely island disperses with their reproductive and other adaptations that make these movements possible. And then after that most fortuitous of arrivals, countless generations more of chance movements giving rise to isolation and speciation, drifting snails, drifting valleys and hills, drifting genes. Each strand is a unique line of movement of relationships and branching transformations. 
These are at least some of the processes that have produced the intricate webs of lives and possibilities that are, that were, the worlds of Hawaii snails. A remarkable, breathtakingly diverse, utterly unrepeatable assemblage of life. To labour to hold this network in mind, however imperfectly, however impossibly, might offer us a glimpse into at least one of the many ways in which these snails matter. And so the significance of what is being lost in their extinction. Doing so might remind us that each of the fragile, fleshy little individuals of Acatonella mustelina or Amastra spirazona surviving in the Palikea exclosure is not so much a member of a species as it is a participant in a lineage, one link in a vast, improbable, intergenerational project. These are projects, lives, histories, and possibilities that are today being radically truncated or simply shorn off, all within the space of a few human generations. With them is disappearing countless unique ways of life and the vast evolutionary heritage that they together comprise. But with them is also disappearing the possibility of our learning to be at home in the world in a way that is responsible for other modes of life, not in isolation, not as barely surviving populations and organisms, but as ongoing processes of entangled life and death, stretching across oceans of time and space that we cannot comprehend. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom, for that expansive, um, illuminating, and by equal measure, uh, a lecture replete with warnings. Uh, truly marvelous in the way you also multiplied, you know, the vocabulary of extinction, I thought, so often dominated by megafauna with gastropods. You know, you spoke of snails, of course, but the talk is about so much more. Um, I want to give you some time now after your talk and also to our audience to consider your words before I attempt to do justice to the numerous questions that will surely follow. Um, I should mention that, you know, we are taking questions for Tom Van Duren through a form that we are pasting into the chat box right now. If you're tuning in through the live stream, you can find it in the comments there too. And if you're on Zoom and prefer to submit a question through the Q&A function, please feel free to do that um, as well. But I just thought I'd, I'd uh, move on to individual questions um, just after uh, maybe a, a broad comment, uh, I think and perhaps something that we can kind of all ponder upon. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering after reading your books and listening to this uh, wonderful talk, um, you know, does the contemporary moment, I suppose, demand the kind of polymathic scope, you know, evidenced in the history of the natural sciences, right? I'm thinking of Humboldt and you mentioned Wallace, of course, you know, who worked on, you know, subterranean plant life among many other things, but was also able to think about um, questions of planetary uh, climate changes. Um, and you also kind of mentioned, you know, 18th century plant collecting, growth of museums that have a tangible connection to empire. And, you know, obviously there are kind of deconstructive tactics required there. But I say this also because there are remarkable confluences here between what you spoke of today, you know, and Mike da Davis's talk in this series that linked the California fires to dead zone vegetation and then to the rubble left in the wake of weapons testing and such during the Second World War. And then finally to the dominance of capital and urbanization today. Um, so I suppose, is that the kind of scholarship that is required or the vision that is required? And, and that comment, I suppose, is related to a specific question that has come up a couple of times now in these forums. You know, you've mentioned elsewhere about the importance of storing and, and, and storing as a way to philosophize uh, in a much more accessible language. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that at all. Yeah, thanks, Malcolm. Um, I guess I, um, I think this is part of what the environmental humanities as a field is up to. Um, uh, I, don't know that, um, I don't know that it's possible for that kind of, um, uh, the kind of polymath that you, you talked about from the past, somebody like Humboldt to, to, to really um, do that kind of work anymore. I mean, I, I know um, in my own research, I'm, I'm pulled into engaging with um, literatures in evolutionary biology and behavioral biology and ecology and uh, even, even just those scientific literatures before we, we move on to thinking about all of the other kinds of political mm -hmm. literatures and ethnographic uh, 
uh, literatures and the, the histories of colonization in these places. And um, I think that the task of, of pulling that together is um, what's well, ultimately impossible and yet vital in the way that you, you just described. So the question, I guess, is how, um, how to do it as best we can um, while, while knowing that we're never going to do it uh, in, any, in any kind of perfect way. And, and in part, that's just to do with the way in which these disciplines have become so much more um, specialised, um, so much, and in some ways, so much more insular. Um, and partly that's, I'm sure, a, a question of progress to, to some extent in scientific disciplines. And partly it's just a question of disciplinary structures and silos and the, and the extent to which we've allowed this kind of siloed thinking that has all sorts of, of other problems. So I guess in my own work, I am trying to do something very interdisciplinary. I don't, uh, I don't have um, ambitions to be, a, to be a Humboldt or a Wallace, um, mm -hmm. not, not only for the, the kinds of um, problematic colonial um, issues that you've pointed to, but, but also, I guess, because um, uh, I think I'm doing, doing something quite different, and obviously in a very different context, and coming out of the humanities with the kind, this kind of emphasis on storytelling. And so a lot of my work gra is grounded in collaboration, I think, is the way in which we, uh, I try to piece together um, mm -hmm. those kind of um, diverse knowledges that I think uh, are needed. Um, and so I'm, I'm being very lucky with the kinds of scientists I work with. And um, in a lot of this Hawaii project, um, and I've, I've just finished writing a book on the Hawaiian snails. So it's been a, a, a sort of a longer term project focused on the snails. Um, and in part, I was drawn into that just by that very generous open um, by community of biologists. Uh, working in Hawaii on the snails and so being able to to meet with them to talk to them to get them to read drafts and give feedback and correct my ignorance around biogeography or evolution or snail chemo reception or whatever it might be uh, is sort of a vital is a vital part of doing that kind of work so it's something that I think is um, is at the core of the environmental humanities and in many ways it's a kind of new set of skills for many humanities scholars um, where we haven't really uh, traditionally learnt to work collaboratively um, so much, to write collaboratively, perhaps even to, and certainly perhaps not with scientists and not with people from well beyond our own fields. So uh, that I think is one of the challenges that the, uh, for the environmental humanities, but it's one that I think people are taking up and exploring in a range of different creative ways. Thank you, Tom. Um, Thank you. Um, and this is actually, uh, I suppose, a, you know, um, related to, to, to a question that's coming up, which is what first interested you about snails? You know, what inspired you to, to pursue this research? You've obviously written uh, about uh, crows, you've written about vultures, um, and, um, you know, and, and it seems to me that a particular life form or a form of life is a lens that allows you to comment on wider ecological processes. Um, so that's a question from Fiona, I suppose, um, uh, and also something that I was going to ask you anyway. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a, a great question. I, um, as you said, uh, most of my last, my previous work has been on birds, on vultures and crows and ravens and albatrosses and all sorts of, um, of other birds. Um, I guess I, um, I, I partly got drawn to the snails by accident. I was in Hawaii working on birds, as many people are in Hawaii. Um, and as I said, I, came, I met some of the, the snail biologists through a, a friend of a friend, Mike Hadfield. Um, and he's been very involved since the 70s and 80s in, in trying to protect these snails. And I guess I was just drawn into the stories that he and others were telling. Um, and in part drawn into them because uh, I just... I was surprised by how incredible these creatures were and how little interest there was in them. Um, and the contrast between uh, working on birds and writing about birds um, and writing about snails, even in an, an incredible, beautiful place like Hawaii, even when the snails are as beautiful as the ones in Hawaii, um, there's a, just an incredible contrast uh, in the, the kind of um, interest that other people have in, in hearing these stories. So mm -hmm. that's a pati uh, particular thank you to everyone who came along to hear about snails today. But, um, but it, it is, a, it is a, ch a challenge, I think, to, to draw people into the worlds of invertebrates. 
Um, and yet invertebrates are really leading the way in the loss of biodiversity around the world. Um, just be, in part because it's just because there's so many of them, 99% of the animal kingdom is invertebrates. Um, but around the world, snails too are particularly um, impacted upon. There have been more documented extinctions of snails around the world than there have been of birds, mammals, amphibians and reptiles combined. Um, and and that's, only the, you know, that's only taking into account the very small number of snails and other invertebrates that have actually been described by science to begin with, let alone assessed by science um, to have their conservation status established. So there's so much that we don't, don't know about most invertebrates uh, on the planet, uh, and yet they're disappearing at a staggering rate too. So mm -hmm. partly for me, I wanted to, to move from the birds who are, who are a little bit more charismatic, at least some of them, um, to thinking about some uh, invertebrates. Um, and I wanted to think about how, what difference that makes for the kinds of extinction stories we tell when we're deal, rather than dealing with a really intelligent um, social uh, species like a, a crow, a, like the Hawaiian crow, some, mm -hmm. some of these endangered crows I've worked on. Um, we're dealing instead with snails who have their own really particular forms of intelligence and, and you know, adaptive behavior that's, that is itself fascinating. Um, but they're very different kinds of creatures. And so I was interested in how we might tell stories that draw people into those snail worlds in a way that um, helps them to see them differently, to, to care for them, um, and also to, to take up questions like these questions around biogeography that I was focused on in this talk. Um, they're just so different when we're talking about birds or, or mammals. So um, and I guess this is an, something I found amongst the birds, but find again in an even more extreme way when turning from the birds to the snails, that the kinds of stories we can tell about extinction are so utterly unique. Um, and so um, attending to, to a diversity of species really matters. And I've just discovered in the, that you can probably all hear in the background um, a chorus of the cicadas. I didn't notice them starting. So um, uh, yeah, if, <laughs> if it sounds like there's something wrong with the audio, that's um, the millions of cicadas that have come out in the Blue Mountains where I live uh, and are making a bit of ruckus in the background. Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's just, it's really marvelous the way you can kind of take one particular uh, life form and kind of expand this out into such kind of meaningful questions. Um, there are uh, some very snail specific questions. I'm not sure if you'd be uh, happy to take them. Uh, well, one of them is, is very practical. Are there ways people can actually get involved in trying to help with the conservation effort uh, in, in Hawaii's uh, um, and in specific relation to snails? Um, and, um, and, and another very specific question, you mentioned rats and the rosy wolf snail as predators of the Acnetella or Actinella, uh, is the new Guinea flatworm a threat? And if so, are the exclosures effective against them? That's a very specific question, testing your biological knowledge there. Um, Great. Um, so uh, in terms of getting involved, I can only say that, um, that some of the people most actively involved in, in snail conservation in Hawaii are the Snail Extinction Prevention Program, who I mentioned, um, and the Bishop Museum. Um, and so I can only recommend that, that people might contact either of those organisations and ask them um, about their internship programs or, or making donations or other ways in which they might get involved. Um, I, both of those organisations are, uh, are very involved with you know, the limited resources and time that they have in uh, reaching out to the community and getting involved with getting the community involved in, in whatever ways they can. Um, uh, the, um, I can't tell you about the, the flatworm, I'm sorry. So um, I, ha I haven't heard discussion about it. Um, so um, uh, so I, I can't say, I'm sorry. It's something I'm, uh, I'm happy to look into and, and report back if someone wants to send me an email. But um, um, it has, it's not a, a predator or a threat that has come up in, um, in any of the discussions I've had with, with biologists in Hawaii. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, these extinction stories um, that are so crucial really to understand this particular moment in time, uh, 
um, I suppose also speak to, you know, both animal studies and, and all these other um, kind of disciplinary offshoots of the environmental humanities, right? And, and I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing your thoughts on, you know, where you see extinction studies or such narratives of extinction fit in to the environmental humanities project, I suppose. Um, I guess for me, they're at the core of it, but that's that's just because it's the, the, they're the topics that I happen to work on. Um, I guess the environmental humanities is understandably a very diverse field, um, both in terms of disciplines, in terms of um, people's geographic and cultural backgrounds, um, but also in terms of the kinds of um, issues that uh, or um, environmental challenges that people uh, are called to work on in one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, while recognising, I guess, that, that, that all of these things are, are tangled up with one another in complicated mm -hmm. ways, climate change, uh, something I didn't talk about with the snails, but, but obviously is, is a significant concern for the future of, them, of the snails. So um, extinction has become my focus, I guess, um, and I was sort mm -hmm. of um, fell into that in, in various ways that we, we, we don't always fully understand. Um, and... And, and into the effort to try and make sense of this period of, of mass species extinction and of what the humanities might contribute to better understanding and responding to it. Um, but within the environmental humanities, I guess there's a, an awful lot of work focused on climate change, on waste, on issues of environmental justice and, and mm -hmm. toxins. And, um, and so, yeah, I guess it's a, um, uh, it's, it's one of the many challenges that people working in the field might choose to focus on. Um, but I guess one of, one of the challenges for all of us is, is to make those connections between mm -hmm. uh, these different crises that, that we're looking at and also to make the connections with the broader systems uh, of uh, capitalist extraction, of colonialism, of militarism um, that are driving a lot of these problems, um, not mm -hmm. just extinction, but climate change and, and so mm -hmm. on. So. Um, I think it's important that, that we, um, we take our specific focus. Um, we, uh, the world is compl too complicated, I think, to try and be, be somebody who works on everything. Um, but we need to, to take up our specific foci in a way that uh, mm -hmm. is, is open and interested and connected mm -hmm. to these other challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of the reason why I ask is, uh, I suppose, um, you know, the the area of extinction um, studies really uh, kind of was brought to the forefront of at least the European intellectual scene with the discovery and naming of dinosaur fossils, right, by Richard Owens, you know, who helped gain traction for, for evolutionary theory, but also extinction theory. And I think, um, and I think part of your talk um, in, in many ways alluded to uh, forms of life traveling and inhabiting um, islands, right, such as a, uh, in, in the Pacific. And I, and I wonder if there are kind of confluences here between, you know, the, the threat that the Pacific Islands actually face, uh, uh, you know, when we compare, uh, let's say, other low-lying islands of, of the planet, right? Um, uh, are you kind of drawn to areas that are kind of marked by precarity? Uh, areas and species that, you know, whose futures appear really adjacent, right? Um, yeah, do, um, some of the time, I, I guess, I mean, I think Hawaii is a, and the more time I, I've spent there, the more complex a place it becomes, as I guess mm. is, is the way these things work. Um, but Hawaii, I mean, especially the main islands, the, the, the high islands, as they call them, um, are, um, uh, pro uh, probably not at least uh, in the imminent danger of, of inundation. Um, I think storms and, and changes in, in rainfall and weather are going to ha definitely have significant impacts in mm -hmm. all throughout the, the island chain. And some of the lower lying islands in the Northwest Hawaiian islands, which are important um, bird breeding colonies and things, um, those islands are at real um, danger of inundation. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I guess on the flip side of those kinds of stories of, of danger and um, coming disaster, um, I'm always, I guess, really mindful. And this is some, a theme I try to take up in more detail in the, in the snail book that I've written. Um, 
with the way in which these stories of extinction in Hawaii are juxtaposed with incredible stories of resurgence and resilience, mm -hmm. especially from Kanaka Maoli. And, and so the, uh, in these same decades um, uh, of the you know, late um, 20th century, while so much has been getting worse with climate change and we've been, you know, those politics have been the, the great acceleration, as we might call it, um, there have been an incredible time for the, the Hawaiian renaissance and, and the resurgence mm. of Hawaiian language and culture and navigation and so much more. Um, so, so the way in which these things are, are um, folded up with one another is, I think, really um, interesting and mm. important to, to me and to the kinds of stories I want to tell. Um, mm. And so I, I guess, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of bad stuff going on in, in, mm -hmm. uh, with the environment around the world. Um, and I, the, the challenge, and I guess I'd, um, in the wake of Crows, the book I published last year, I tried to reflect on this really consciously for the first time with, through this notion of the wake, um, that a lot of my writing has been both a, a, a celebration of, um, I should start the other way around, it's been kind of a, um, an, an act of mourning of, of grief and acknowledgement of what is being lost. Uh, and at the same time, a celebration of, of these incredible forms of life, some of which have already been lost, others of which will be lost, but an effort not to, not to just mourn, although mourning can be a productive and powerful response, but, um, but to also celebrate and um, appreciate the wonder and the resilience and the, um, so that is the kind of attitude, I guess, that I think characterizes the work I'm trying to do with extinction. Mm. And so it's holding those, um, those contexts uh, in, in dialogue with one another. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I personally find, and I know some of my students too, uh, personally find your, you know, refusal to fetishize apocalypse, right? Um, uh, or the end of the world, uh, very, very appealing. Um, because, you know, um, in places like Hawaii um, and other Pacific Islands, the apocalypse is very much in, in, in the past, really, and, and everything is in the wake of, as you, as you kind of mentioned in your, in your, in your book. Um, yeah, and, you know, so I'm not sure if it is directly related, but, um, but there is a kind of an ethical uh, stroke political question, I suppose, um, that is being asked uh, here um, in, in a number of forums. Um, you know, Tim is asking if snails can no longer survive in their habitats, but must instead be kept only in enclosures and labs. Uh, what is the purpose of keeping them from going extinct? Um, and, you know, I think he means the question instrumentally, but also um, not only about snails, but about other life forms that, that humans are killing off, you know. Yeah, this is a really great question. And um, it's another one that I that I struggle with in the in this the book I've been writing um, um, because I think that is that is kind of the situation um, the snails can't re the vast majority of Hawaiian snail species can't really survive outside exclosures or the lab um, and yeah. worse than that there isn't really a, a, a clear idea about how that situation might change um, in order to have snails living beyond those protected areas really we would need to or they would need to um, remove kill on mass um, all of the, the especially the predatory snails the rosy wolf snails um, this is, there's some thought that maybe the snails could survive the predation by rats and at least from some people uh, by rats and chameleons and others if the, the, the predatory snails were out of the picture. Um, even that is, is questionable, but, um, but how to control predatory snails across you know, dense forests across the islands is, um, mm. and these snails are everywhere through, throughout the Hawaiian high, high Hawaiian islands. Um, it, there is just a, as yet no real um, approach to how that might be done. Um, so at this stage, yeah, it is a, it's a sort of a banking project with the hope that something will change in the future um, without really knowing exactly what that will look like. Um, and I think that's, um, that's really tough. It's, a, it's particularly tough, I'm sure, for the, the scientists who live in that context every day. Um, mm -hmm. And... It's tough also because the, what, you know, these safe areas that we can move snails into are not safe in any kind of absolute way. I mean, the, the last time the, 
earlier this year the hur- during the pandemic the I've forgotten the name of the hurricane that that hit uh, or didn't hit but came close to Honolulu um, or you know those thousands of snails had to be evacuated um, from the laboratory um, environment to be taken to a safer kind of bunker space and so so it's no, there's no guarantees even within these safe spaces um, that that you're going to survive uh, into an uncertain future. Um, so that is a it's not only a lot of work, it's a lot of um, of heartache and um, for the, the people who are involved in in this work on a daily basis. I guess the mm-hmm. bigger ethical um, existential question, as the, as it was put, um, is is also a challenging one. I think um, mm-hmm. I. Um, I think it's really ultimately a question of, of hope and how we, um, how our, the politics of hope in these kinds of difficult spaces. Um, and I've written about this before in the, the context of thinking about it as a kind of hospice earth, um, where, where more and more of our captive programs for endangered species are ending up in this situation where we are holding on to things whose worlds have disappeared. Um, without a sense of how how or where we might ever put them back. Um, and worse than that, I think this, this huge push to try and clone and resurrect species, uh, again, with very little sense most of the time of where they might go or how they might um, be uh, reproduced to, to, to significant numbers in captivity in order to be released, um, and then where they might go. Um, so, yeah, I think we are increasingly ending up in this situation where um, we are holding on to things um, that don't have anywhere to go. Um, and every now and again, I think, you know, it works out and we find some way of, of getting them back into the world. Um, a lot of it, sometimes they die quietly in captivity and um, that's the end of it. Um, and I think that we just don't know which of those futures uh, are the one, is, which of those is going to happen for each of these different Hawaiian snail species. Um, I guess I see the work, though, of holding on to them as important. Um, I think especially if we can hold on to them in ways that, you know, it's not, not too diminished a form of life for snails, which is, you know, I think a real question, but one that is difficult to ask. Um, I think that there, there's something powerful about the encounter with these creatures whose worlds have been systematically destroyed. Um, uh, and... I think holding on to them creates this space for a kind of ongoing reckoning, an ongoing um, reflection, and 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 I think pushes us in some way to to do better, um, even if there's not much that we can do for these particular species. Um, there's something about that encounter with creatures who go on living in the absence of a world that can sustain them. Um, mm that demands something of us uh, and to allow them to just slip away um, undermines that. I think uh, we do have to ask, as I said, real questions about the conditions under which they live. And I think, you know, holding elephants in captivity, for example, so they can be a reminder to us about our poor environmental practices is, is not a good strategy. Um, holding snails in captivity is a very different prospect for a whole range of reasons. Um, and so I think they have this, potential to um, to interrupt and demand something different, um, even if it may well be too late for some of them. Yeah, I mean, Ulrich Beck talked about the unintended consequences, right, of which we are kind of um, um, all inheritors. Um, I quite like the way actually you, you linked uh, the the shells losing color and the museumization of snails, right? Um, and actually, Judith is also wondering here. Um, you know, are the multicolored shells somehow kind of related to to their uh, vulnerability at all? That's a, a fascinating question. Um, it's fascinating in part because um, snails don't really see so well, or if at all. Um, the, the things that most people think are eyes, the, the, the um, little bulges on the end, well, they are eye bulges on the end of their, their upper tentacles. Um, uh, they are light sensing, but they, for most species, are just sensing um, light and dark. Um, and so snails are instead relying on chemoreception, uh, smell tasting the uh, chemical signals in the air and the environment. Um, and so, um, 
the colours are sort of not um, not relevant for the snails themselves. It's just something that I've always found fascinating that the, there are these beautiful snails uh, in Hawaii with so many diverse patterns and colours. And um, but they're not only are they not seen by the snails, um, they're not um, therefore any part of the kind of snail behaviour or or any kind of sex selection or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so they're they're, they're kind of um, yeah, I find that in itself fascinating. Um, in terms of whether or not it's relevant to their decline, um, it, it's relevant in the, to the extent that shell collectors, human shell collectors really cared about colours and patterns and, and decimated some species more than others, the ones that were deemed to be beautiful. Um, it's not relevant so much in Hawaii as far as anyone has studied for predation. Um, so it's not that the big, you know, the brightly coloured shells are... Um, uh, you know, making them more obvious to predators and things like that. Um, I, I, there hasn't been any um, study um, of that as a possible factor for the Hawaiian snails. Uh, it wouldn't be a factor for the rosy wolf snail for obvious reasons. It wouldn't be seeing mm. the colour. Um, I'm not sure about for rats, for example, whether it's it um, makes a difference um, or, or how rats hunt, but, I, but it hasn't been the subject of, of study. Um, Something else I want to... It's, oh, yeah, so, so where all that colour comes from then is, I think, really interesting. And it, it was some really um, fascinating work done in the, in the, by a missionary um, who was also a kind of a biologist, um, Thomas Gulick, who um, basically ex explained, especially amongst these... I'm sorry, I keep looking over the screen because I've got a picture of a snail there. Um, I shouldn't be talking to the snail. Um, but uh, Thomas Gulick, who did all this work to uh, and hypothesised that the really diverse snail shell colours amongst the big Acatinella tree snails um, are a product of um, basically uh, genetic drift. Um, it's not that they are adaptive in any way, being brightly coloured or patterned. Um, it's just that these isolated populations have developed random mutations that wander off in different directions. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Um, I just want, wanted to remind our readers, you know, um, to everybody, uh, sorry, to our audience, everybody listening in uh, to join us for a brief 20 to 25 minute discussion uh, group immediately following uh, this event exactly at 7.30. And I think we just have a minute or so to go. Uh, and it's going to be facilitated these discussion groups by a group of environmental humanities graduate students. Um, and these will take place in separate Zoom meetings. So please take a look at the Zoom chat box or the Facebook and YouTube comments for information um, on, on how to join. But Tom, that's a really marvelous talk, uh, expansive. Uh, um, and I, you know, we all, I'm sure, greatly enjoyed uh, uh, and were eliminated by these amazing um, um, observations that you kind of made. So thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you all for coming.